So uh, thank you for having me, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly, maybe uh, about some uh, subjects that I think are of interest, and then Jack will maybe uh, hone in a little bit more specifically on uh, the, the topics that, um, um, uh, that are specific to uh, traceability, especially on uh, the beef side of things. But uh, there's a lot happening across the animal industry right now as far as uh, cares and concerns, and I'd just like to talk about a few of those just uh, from a USDA perspective. As you know, we're in Iowa right now, and uh, Iowa is a part of the Midwest that is suffering from some of the effects of a, a long, hard winter, uh, flooding that uh, has impacted the eastern side of Iowa, as well as Nebraska, and I don't think we're done seeing the effects of flooding uh, as it spreads up into the Dakotas and maybe even the Yellowstone River is above flood stage in Montana right now. And so USDA, I have, a, I have had the opportunity to travel on behalf of the secretary to see some of the impacts in my home state of Nebraska. And uh, you know the, the flooding impacts that you see uh, uh, on the internet and that you see in social media uh, are accurate. It's, uh, it's very devastating. Uh, you know, where you see today the Elkhorn River, I think, is uh, at a four foot level, which is probably a little bit elevated, but maybe close to normal. At one time, it was 24 and a half feet at flood stage, and so think about how that spreads out uh, in uh, what uh, is a fairly uh, a part of Nebraska that is fairly flat uh, to start out with. Um, you know, uh, as you move across Nebraska, though, the impacts I think that other states in the Midwest and the upper Midwest, especially, have felt with uh, you know uh, long-term snow cover. Uh, that has required additional feed resources, uh, repeated uh, bouts of long-term cold that has uh, uh, made it challenging for uh, the mama cows just to maintain weight as well as the, the pressure that's put on feedlot cattle. I think we've seen a, a several month convergence of items that have made beef production uh, especially hard. And so as you look at some of the programs that we've been talking about to provide flood relief, USDA has opened uh, the window of opportunity uh, for county committees to look at that long-term compound effect for the livestock indemnity program for producers that maybe have felt the impact of the polar vortex or uh, uh, just the uh, mud that uh, many producers are dealing with as well as opportunities to look uh, over a, a larger window than the one that's uh, initially provided under the Livestock Indemnity Program, which I think will be useful to, to some of the producers, especially cow-calf producers uh, across the upper Midwest. Um, you know, the Farm Bill is, uh, we're working very hard to get that implemented at USDA as well right now. Uh, one of the things that your organization probably has been most interested in as we've gone through that is the new uh, three-legged stool that we talked about and we worked with Congress from a technical assistance uh, perspective at APHIS to take a look at how do we uh, uh, take different components that we've used for years with you know, border surveillance, uh, working with producer organizations, and industry groups to see how we uh, continue to increase biosecurity and awareness about how uh, producers can help be a part of protecting themselves as well as partnering with USDA to get, keep pests and dis diseases out of the U.S. with our laboratory network that uh, many states uh, struggle to have the resources to not only maintain accreditation but also have enough diagnostic ability available in the event that we did have an animal disease outbreak. With a new concept that uh, was uh, part of the discussion very uh, uh, in the forefront with a vaccine bank. And so uh, Congress allocated some upfront money as well as uh, some uh, authority for us to work within those three uh, 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 areas of emphasis to be able to figure out how we divide up and prioritize those monies 
to have impact not only for the pork and beef industry, which I think drove that debate around the vaccine bank, but also look at other um, species, uh, especially the poultry industry that, tr uh, that struggles from time to time with disease outbreaks as well, to have a balanced approach that, uh, that everybody can benefit from. And so part of what we're in the process of doing right now at USDA as we work to implement those Farm Bill provisions is we need to hear from the industry. And so we've had uh, many different uh, sectors come into the office, uh, even groups within those sectors come in to talk to us about what they see as priorities for the investment of those dollars. And Dr. Shear and his team are busy taking a look at uh, if we were going to start looking at a vaccine bank, which vaccines would we have in that? Would we want to include some poultry vaccines as well? And then uh, if we're thinking merely about uh, foot and mouth disease, you know, there's 24 strains uh, plus or minus out there at any given time floating around. You know, do we want to, which ones would we concentrate on? Do we want to assume that it'll be an accidental introduction or a terroristic introduction, which makes a difference on which strains you think might be important? So, and then how do we invest in something that might have a, a five year shelf life so that uh, maybe there's a way to uh, rotate that, uh, that stockpile and get value out of it on both ends? Uh, uh, through its effective life and then as it's uh, getting down to the its expiration date is there a way we can cycle that out to recoup some of our investment to be able to use uh, reuse down the road and so we're having those discussions right now if any of you have special insights i'm sure uh, dr Shear would love to hear those and uh, but uh, very much uh, the door is open to that discussion right now and uh, and uh, would love to hear from you Obviously, as we talk about a vaccine bank, uh, probably the disease that is uh, of most uh, top of mind concern right now is something that there isn't a vaccine for, and that's African swine fever. And the pork industry is very much concerned about African swine fever. You know, if you look at uh, the numbers, I think the pork industry had their economists put together some numbers based on uh, anecdotal as well as eyewitness uh, reports from people that have traveled in and out of China since August. Uh, you know, they believe that the impact on China's pork production could be as much as 50%. And so as you start looking at that for a country that it is the, the, by far the majority of the protein source as far as red meat or meat is concerned, for their population. That has significant uh, opportunities to be disruptive within their, their food supply, as well as uh, disruptive uh, as far as world trade goes and how product moves uh, uh, around the world. And so I think we also should not uh, underestimate uh, how that might play into as we move forward in trade agreements and negotiating trade in agreements of how that might inspire uh, countries to, to move forward uh, uh, with us and uh, be able to open up and, and reestablish nor, uh, normalizing trade, not only with China, but within that region as well. And so we're going to continue to uh, uh, redouble our efforts so at the border to protect uh, the U.S. industry. I think uh, there's a couple things at play there. One is uh, we're working very closely with the swine industry. Uh, I probably talk to uh, one of the leaders in the swine industry at least once a week, if not more often. Uh, here a few weeks ago, probably a month now it's been, we invited them in to take a look at all the concerns that uh, you hear in popular media, in the industry media, as well as producer to producer conversations because it seemed like the same issues that we thought we had talked about keep resurfacing as issues of concern. And so we sat down with them. I think they brought in a list of 12 concerns by the time we were done adding on the ones that we had heard at different times. We talked about 17 different items of concern, whether that be uh, feed and feed additives, uh, uh, animal movement, people movement, what's going on at the border, uh, beagles uh, and how we might be able to enhance that. 
uh, we uh, came out with a list of uh, uh, four or five different things that we were going to do immediately, which included putting an, uh, 60 more beagles at the border for CBP to use as uh, surveillance of passenger as well as cargo traffic. Uh, but we also talked about some things that you know you hear about a lot, like feed additives and whether or not do we have testing protocols that are accurate and reliable, is this a real threat, and does the industry, can they shut down the movement of feed and feed additives and still be able to uh, uh, maintain high quality diets. And that was an area that we landed that we probably uh, uh, don't have enough reason to, uh, to, to cause shutdown there and uh, that the impact on the industry, the negative impact, impact uh, might be more harmful than any perceived gain that we would get through, uh, through taking action there right now. But we agreed to continue looking at science, continue analyzing and figuring out where uh, we not only moved on that issue, but many other issues as well. And so I think that that is something that's uh, been a positive. We've also increased our conversations with Customs and Bureau Protection as we move forward. And uh, we have increased the, uh, the level of activity with our SITSI group. And what that group is within APHIS is that's a group of inspectors that go around to ethnic markets and grocery stores and they look at uh, the mix of products that are in those and they're trying to identify prohibited products that are making it some way into the United States even though they're prohibited. And as part of that we've been able to identify, continue to identify, that's an active group that works all the time, but we've increased maybe our focus a little bit on, uh, on meat products that might be of concern coming from China. And so when you saw the million pound uh, seizure in, uh, in uh, New Jersey a few weeks ago, that was a result of us identifying importers that we thought might be circumventing the system and asking CBP, CBP to tag those importers and take a look at some of their shipments. Now while that made a big media splash, in reality it was probably about 38,000 pounds of pork uh, related products that uh, were of concern, very much still prohibited, but uh, they were um, uh, like bullion in noodle bowls that uh, while it was still prohibited, it's been processed and probably the virus is, has been attenuated and wasn't of real concern. It was uh, uh, candied pork uh, that uh, also had gone through a processing process that probably wasn't of concern, but nonetheless it's prohibited. And so we want to lock down on that. And we're going to continue to uh, uh, work in partnership with CBP. We're going to continue to, to do everything we can in cooperation with the industry to, con to, to protect the pork industry. I think the last thing that I want to leave you with on that subject, though, is that the same epidemiology that we have relied on and used to protect ourselves from China with their uh, endemic foot and mouth disease and their endemic classical swine fever is the same protocols that we continue to rely on to keep African swine fever out. And uh, we uh, can point to a long uh, record uh, over a century of being able to use those programs and our vigilance at the border to protect ourselves from foot and mouth disease and many other diseases. And so I think that that uh, shows that, uh, that uh, the system has the opportunity to work and hopefully with redouble, redoubling our efforts, we put more confidence into that as well. There are some uh, parallels out there though that uh, where the industry does have some levels of concern. You know, high path avian influenza marched across the, the Midwest very rapidly a few years ago. But I think that gave the poultry industry an opportunity to question its biosecurity protocols, the way they move feed in and products out of uh, those poultry operations. And I think we've seen them take measures to try to address that. Um, uh, I think we've also, as uh, PEDV uh, moved across the Midwest a few years ago, the pork industry had the opportunity 
to uh, take a look at some of those protocols that were in place and, um, and uh, question whether or not they had sufficient biosecurity in place uh, there. But I also think that we, we're not completely there domestically because uh, the last few summers we've had Seneca Valley virus that has continued to show up at our packing plants and cause disruptions at different times, some of it longer term, some of it more short term. But a Seneca Valley virus presents itself like a foot and mouth disease. And the fact that those hogs are showing up at slaughter facilities presenting those, uh, uh, those clinical signs tells us that uh, not everybody is making the right decision and calling the vet at the right time when they load those hogs up or else the, they shouldn't be presenting themselves in the numbers that they have been in the past. So I think I want to challenge uh, the, the leaders in this room, the uh, veterinarians, the state veterinarians, the industry people in this room to, uh, you know, there's, there's things we need to continue to challenge our producers to do the right thing to not only protect themselves but to protect their industry. And uh, you know, maybe we're, uh, you know, we've seen Seneca Valley so many times we think we know what it is, but I'm not sure that's the right decision we should be making uh, in this day and age with uh, the fear that we have about African um, um, swine fever out there. And so I, I think we need to continue to challenge each other as we move forward. Um, we also um, are working very closely, and I'm going to attend a symposium here in a few weeks in Canada to work with our North American partners to make sure that we're not only talking about African swine fever and making sure that uh, all three nations are vigilant and working together and communicating, but there's also some other diseases that we can, uh, can make progress on and pests, you know, on the southern border, uh, cattle fever tick is an area that we want to be able to work together with Mexico to be able to address uh, maybe some new tactics on both sides of the, uh, the border to be able to uh, continue to have an effective program in the U.S. that doesn't face pressure from Mexico all the time. And so we want to, uh, want to work there as well. Um, I think that uh, we also uh, want to make some progress. Uh, you know, I think we have good progress going on between us and Canada with uh, movement of, of cattle, but I think we can do some things to uh, uh, electronically share data between uh, the U.S. and Mexico to enhance that, the movement of animals there. And uh, I've set some uh, kind of aggressive goals for us at USDA to try to uh, move forward with that electronic transfer uh, that hopefully within, uh, within the year, if not soon thereafter, uh, we figured out how we can uh, uh, help facilitate that exchange of electronic data. And once that's in place, we could have a system where the information and the traceability we have on Mexican cattle might exceed the traceability we have within our domestic herd. And so I think that that should uh, redouble our, uh, our uh, drive and desire to be able to uh, to keep up uh, with uh, international countries uh, within our domestic herd uh, as well. And so uh, um, maybe just a, a last couple of things to talk about before I jump into uh, the beef side of it a little bit. Um, um, as we look at other industries outside the animal industry and uh, see what is going on in the fruit and vegetable industry, and what some of the large retail chains are saying to us in that space. Uh, we have some of the very largest retailers uh, telling the uh, fruit and vegetable growers are, uh, all over the world that they want traceability within the system uh, here very soon, within 12 months. And that includes blockchain capability in some cases where they want to be able to use blockchain to trace that. Now, whether or not blockchain is the end-all answer, it's one that they've identified right now as a tool that they want to explore and try to uh, use to manage that system. But I think that if uh, they're successful within the produ produce industry, 
of driving that forward. I think it's very likely that the, the meat industry is the, is the next place that they're going to look to want to have traceability and demand traceability for products that are going to move into their retail outlets. And so that's another reason why I think that uh, talk about traceability uh, is getting more and more serious uh, to the industry. And we're going to see those segments of the industry and those uh, marketing uh, systems that can embrace that traceability uh, be able to be more successful uh, in some of those uh, retail chains that, uh, that are expecting and going to be insisting that traceability. I think we're uh, doing some great things uh, uh, in the state of Kansas uh, and Chelsea's here that uh, LMA has been a great partner with their cattle trace product, uh, project where they've uh, done a, a pilot project that they're now expanding outside of Kansas and embracing states all around them as well as states in the southeast to be able to see how a system of traceability can work. Uh, between segments, between different marketing and arrangements and alignments, I, I think we're going to learn something. And I hope that that helps producers understand, especially cow-calf producers, understand how that impacts them. And I think that's a, an important step that we at USDA also need to work on, is how do we get out and talk to those cow-calf producers that probably are the most reluctant sector within the beef industry at embracing traceability and understanding uh, why it is of value to them. And so later this fall, or hopefully late this summer yet, we hope to have some modules that uh, USDA is able to work with animal health officials, with industry trade groups, to be able to go uh, into states or maybe e even into individual counties and talk about what traceability means to a cow-calf producer. Help a cow-calf producer in the sand hills of Nebraska understand that if we have foot and mouth disease in Kansas, he's not immune to the stop movement order that might be nationwide if we aren't able to pinpoint where the disease originated and how far it spread. And that means that maybe in the month of October, he won't be able to take that asset that he has in the calf crop and convert it to cash, that he's going to have to figure out an alternative that might mean weaning his calves that he doesn't have the facilities for and then figuring out how he's going to feed those uh, calves that he uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't planned on for winter feed until we can lift that stop movement order. And anything we can do to show that he's not part of that disease chain or that disease risk uh, makes it uh, uh, a quicker process for us to be able to release uh, his operation into interstate commerce again and help them him convert that asset into cash. And I think those are the type of arguments and understandings that we haven't been effective in communicating that will help them start uh, feeling that they have something that is at risk and a reason to be involved. And then if we uh, couple that down the road with the retail industry saying we have to have a certain level of traceability or else we're not going to allow your product into our, into our uh, uh, meat case, that's uh, going to start a, a case of sending signals um, uh, through the marketplace that are financial signals that I think will help drive uh, traceability as well. And maybe uh, you know, that's the role that, uh, that NIAA helps us play is how do we make the compelling arguments at the producer level that help embrace adoption and help them uh, embrace a, uh, a more open-minded approach to animal ID? How do we get the message out? I think we've done a great job talking to leadership groups. I think we've done a great job helping uh, uh, segments of the industry at the leadership level and at the animal health uh, official level and state and federal government understand the importance of animal disease traceability. But I'm not sure at the cow-calf level we've been as effective at, at helping them understand uh, their role and, and how they play into a system and what would be required of them and how, how we can help them in, in become part of a traceability system. We're going to continue at USDA 
to work on um, uh, figuring out how we uh, facilitate between states and between uh, segments of the industry the exchange of data and how we develop a network where we can query systems. Uh, it's the same four points that uh, I uh, probably talked about last year when I was here. Uh, uh, you know, I guess that was in Denver that time. But uh, you know, the, we need to figure out how we exchange data between states, between states and the federal government, how we maybe research the opportunities to look at private data systems to be able to query information from them if that uh, helps us get where we want and uh, how we um, also then enhance the overall ability to be able to use electronic health certificates to transfer information between states and the federal government as well. And I think those are, uh, are parts of the puzzle that uh, are the, the bedrock of a traceability system that uh, we're working hard to uh, have available as we look forward. So again, maybe just to recap, and then if there's time for a few questions, I'd be willing to take those. Uh, you know, I think that uh, there's lots of diseases out there that are of concern. There's lots of challenges within the animal industry where uh, not only protecting, uh, putting up a great uh, uh, system at the border is important, but where we put up systems to protect individual operations, our own operations, and we take responsibility for that as individual producers to be vigilant and, and not take unnecessary risks. And how we communicate those up and down the line, I think, are, are just as important as maybe having the overall uh, big systems in place, whether it be how we're going to, what, what technology we're going to use or multiple technologies or, or what have you in that discussion. Uh, there's there's uh, little components that matter. I think that uh, uh, partnerships are also uh, very important and maybe something that we haven't emphasized enough uh, or I haven't emphasized enough in this conversation. Uh, but you know, working USDA to the industry, USDA to states, uh, USDA to uh, uh, you know, other countries around the world, I think is all part of the partnership that we're looking to form to be able to do that. I think there's partnerships within this room that uh, have room to be strengthened to be able to help us continue to, uh, to not only protect our livestock industry but to drive traceability within that because we know that consumers want to know. We, you look anywhere in the meat case, you look anywhere on e a box of cereal, you, you can walk down any aisle in the grocery store and there's some kind of a message on that that is trying to tell a consumer where that, piece, that, that food ingredient came from or where that item uh, came from or how it was produced. It might be non-GMO, it might be family farm, it, it might, it's all kinds of terminology that we don't even know what means sometimes, or nobody, it, if you asked six people in this room, you might get six different impressions on what natural means, but they're, they're trying to use that to communicate to a consumer. And so that tells us that there's value in communicating with our consumers and having messages that help them understand how their food was produced and where it comes from. So with that, I would um, uh, say thank you. And if there's a few minutes, I would take a few questions. Questions? Uh, 
I think that uh, you know we have. I think states have four different uh, management systems they're using right now, and we have varying levels of ability to exchange that information between states or between states and the federal government. So we're working right now to to be able to to build those. Uh, uh, those software bridges that will allow us to exchange that information. You know, that's going to help us with program diseases for sure. And so uh, we, even managing program diseases, uh, that's going to give us pieces of information along that, uh, that traceability trail. But I think that uh, maybe a, a another bridge that we need to work with and that where you guys uh, in the industry because you have industry software that you use that uh, um, contains data that in the event of an animal disease event would be very helpful in gathering non-program uh, movements of animals that uh, I, I think that uh, would love to ha open up that conversation about how do we build those software bridges where we could maybe query and exchange that information only to protect, you know, uh, movement or protect disease spread, uh, and, and but have have those in place. And I, th I think that's somewhere where we could work together on some of our goals to have that that communication be able to move. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, if we're going to demand as a country that our producers identify all the cattle individually, which is, I think, the road we're headed down. What are we going to tell those producers concerning cattle and or beef that's being imported into the United States? What are we going to tell them about the history of that product before it gets to the United States? Because having lived through the country of origin labeling and we told those people, well, look, it's going to help you because your beef is going to be identified as coming from the United States, which in fact it wasn't ever, uh, not that I can find anyway. And we got, are we going to tell them now that you're going to do this, but it probably country uh, imported beef is not going to have to do that, or what are they going to have to do? So I think what, uh, what the opportunity for domestic producers through a traceability program is to be able to align with branded programs that are, is able to make claims about uh, traceability and so consumers uh, that are interested in a product that is is traceable that is uh, you know produced in Montana or Nebraska or Kansas will be able to embrace that opportunity and I think the other thing though that we have to help our producers understand is that we have the least coverage for traceability of any country in the nation or in the world right now. Uh, the people that are sending us a product uh, all have traceability systems that probably exceed ours. And uh, for the live animals that we're bringing in from Mexico right now, I, I firmly believe that we have more traceability in those animals than we have in our domestic animals right now. And so for producers to be able to point at other countries and say that they're the, the they're uh, they're not up to our par. I I, I don't think that's that's a, a fair assumption for a producer to make anymore. I, I agree, except most producers don't know that. And so that's part of the education process that we have to work with. We have to try to uh, get that uh, that information out, and that's that's where I talked about earlier that. Uh, we haven't done the job that we need to do as USDA. We haven't done the job we need to do as organizations and as animal health officials to get past the, this leadership level and get down to the rank and file producer and help them understand the, the reality of, of what's going on, not only in the world, but within uh, you know, their own state. Maybe time for one more burning question. Thanks for your comments so far. Uh, you mentioned the Mexican feeder cattle electronic data exchange. Do you have a goal or a timeline to put that in place? So uh, what our big hurdle right now is to uh, make sure that we have security in place and Jack, nod your head no or yes if I get off, off track here. So that, uh, huh? <laughs> 
so that uh, as we ch exchange that data, we don't have security risks you know, going from one federal government system into another and either be assured that they have the cybersecurity network and protections in place that we have in place, or we need to find a third party that we can uh, transfer that data through. And so I've asked uh, USDA, uh, our Office of uh, Chief Information Officer, to uh, redouble and prioritize that within USDA to be able to figure out how we can get that done. Uh, you know, my personal goal or what I asked him was for by the end of the year, I don't know if we'll make it or not, it's, it's a pretty important hurdle to be able to be sure we cleared because we don't want to, you know, put our data or our information systems at risk at USDA. But it, if we don't set some type of a deadline, you know, it's always in the future. Thank you.